They arrest a guy named Peter. He's actually about to die. King Herod's like, I killed James. I'm going to kill this dude. It's easy. They have him so locked down, he's got prisoners on each side. Now, how do you respond to something like this? If you respond like Jesus, you'll have an open door. This dude's fast asleep. He's so asleep, an angel of the Lord shows up, has to kick Peter to get him up. He's so deep in sleep. And yet, when he kicks him and wakes him up, he breaks off every chain, past every guard. The iron bars couldn't even keep him down because when God opens a door, no man can shut it. But how did that opening manifest? He became like Jesus. I want to talk to you today prophetically. There's many times that when I preach, I preach a a teaching out of the Bible or I'll preach a, 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 a principle that God wants us to know. But then there's times God speaks to me and He wants to say something in a certain season that the church may be in. And for the past couple of months, I've been wrestling and working through a word that God has spoken to my heart. And I want to release that word for our church today. And it's simply this, that God has an open door for you today. Come on, give me a shout, amen. Look at your neighbor and say, God's got an open door for you. I don't know if you've ever been in a place where you felt like the heavens were closed, you've been praying about a certain topic, and it hasn't happened, or you thought you had a promise from God, but you've been through this mundane season, and it seems like it's never going to flip over, it's never going to change. I'm here to tell you that today is your day for an open door, that God in this season has an open door over your life. I like this, we're going to preach over here today, come on. No. And it's beautiful. God has been speaking this over my life. You know, sometimes God speaks something to me and I'm like, God, are you really saying this to me? Are you really saying this to us? And so he spoke this this passage out of Revelation, the third chapter. If you can turn there in your Bibles, Revelation, the third chapter. Some of you are like, I didn't bring my Bible. That's okay. We're going to put it up on the screen for you. We love you. But in Revelation, the third chapter, he speaks to this church in Philadelphia. Now, he speaks to seven churches. Five of them get strong corrections. One of them gets, an, you're doing all right. But this church in Philadelphia, Jesus gives the gold star. He's like, you're amazing. Y'all are doing awesome. And I love what he says here. He says, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right? These things say, he who is holy, he who is true. He who has the key of David... He who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut. Look at your neighbor and say, nobody's going to shut my door. (laughs) And no one can shut it, for you have little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. I love this because God has set before us an opportunity. The question is, are we willing to walk through it? Um, uh, So I did go on vacation and and once a year we go visit our in-laws in in the middle of Montana called Lewistown. And we'll go to the rodeo and fair and it's an amazing time. I love spending time with my kids. And I've watched my kids at the fair go from the small roller coaster to now they're kind of medium. They're going through these swings that fly in the air. It's, It's just fun to watch them grow up. And there was this really scary roller coaster called the Super Loop. And the super loop is pretty much a cage on wheels. Like it just goes over and over like this. And none of my kids are wanting to ride the super loop. And I'm like, somebody's got to ride the super loop with me. So I look at my youngest son and I say, hey, Robbie, you, you, will you ride the super loop with me? And he's like, daddy, I'm not riding that ride. Like just straight up. If you know Robbie, he doesn't talk that clear. On that one he was. He's like, I ain't riding that one. I said, would you ride it for 50 bucks? He's like, daddy, I'm not riding that thing for 50 bucks. I said, well, what would you ride it for? And he said, $100. I said, what about 90? So we end up riding the ride for $90. And and even on our way up, the the guys are like, no, he's too small. And I'm like, Robbie, go go over there. Stand over there by the bar. You're tall enough. And he's trying to stand like this to get out of it. Put your legs together. So they let him on the ride. So we get locked in. If you know anything about fair rods, the bar goes down to the biggest person. So Robbie ain't got no kind of support in this ride. I'm like, hold on for dear life, son. And so we start doing loops, and he's like, Daddy, my butt just left the seat. 
We get off the ride. He's a little frazzled. He's walking off. And these middle school kids are arguing about if they should get on it or not. I'm a proud dad. I'm like, that little kid just rode it, right? And we get off the ride, and, and I say, Robbie, would you ride that again? He's like, no, nah, Daddy, I wouldn't ride that again. I'm not doing that one again. I said, what about for $90? He's like, I'd have to think about that, right? See, my son saw the opportunity, not the ride. He saw the $90, and he was willing to push past fear for that opportunity. My question is, are you willing to walk through the open door that God has for you in this season? So I want to give you just kind of three things that I have found out of this passage. And the first thing is this, Jesus is the key man. Jesus is the key man. Jesus has the key, the access, the authority to get you into places that you couldn't get in in a previous season. Uh, when I would come up here in the summers and spend time with my grandfather, he was pastor of this church and, and he had, you know, every door had a separate key and my grandfather would wear this belt that had a key ring on it and it had all of the keys for every room and access. And I would love to run around the church and I'd, I'd come to doors and I'd be like, man, I can't get into this closet. How do I, let me go talk to the key man, right? Now we don't do that anymore. One key opens them all, man. I'm like a Lord of the Rings kind of guy. And so, uh, Never mind. You got to be a nerd to like that joke. But um, so, so I, I want you to catch this though. If I wanted to get into a room here in the church, I went to the guy that had authority. If you want to get access to your destiny, you have to go to the key man. Too often we're not going to that key man and he wants to open the door. But there's also a requirement of faithfulness. Notice he doesn't say this to all seven churches. He just picks out one that says you've been faithful. And he's actually, when he uses these words, it's not in a vacuum. The prophet Isaiah had actually prophetically revealed this about Jesus' nature when he talks to King, Isaiah talks to King Hezekiah. Now, King Hezekiah had two servants. One servant was unfaithful. He was stealing the money from the king. He was trying to build his own uh, 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 grave and funeral. That, that was a big prestige. So as he's trying to steal the money, the prophet Isaiah comes to him and says, you've been unfaithful with this, this stewardship that God's called you to. And then Isaiah points to another servant who's been faithful. Look at this in Isaiah, the 22nd chapter, the 20th verse. It says, Then it shall be in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, now this is the faithful servant, the son of Hilkah, I will clothe him with your robe and strengthen him with your belt. I will commit your responsibility into his hand. He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Look, look at verse 22. It's beautiful. This is where Jesus quotes it again. The key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder. So he shall open and no one shall shut. And he shall shut and no one shall open. I will fasten him as a peg in a secure place. And he will become a glorious throne to his father's house. I want you to see here and notice that Hezekiah is prophesying and saying, the faithless servant won't have access, but the one that was faithful will. This is something G Jesus reiterates when he talks about the parable of the stewardship. Whether you get it in Matthew or Luke, it's pretty much the same thing. There's three servants. The king hands out talents to each of the servants, and two of them are super faithful. In fact, they come back and they say, I've doubled what you've given me. And he says, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a little. Then he opens the door, be ruler over much. But the wicked and lazy servant who went to the king and said, I knew you to be a hard man. You gather where you don't scatter. You reap where you don't sow. He says, oh, since you knew me to be this way, let me take that from you and you be cast into outer darkness. And then what does he do? I love this. He says, take that talent from the unfaithful and give it to the one that was faithful. See, God is a, needs a requirement that if you want an open door, you got to be faithful. That I, I don't get a lot of amens. That's okay. But when you've been faithful in a season, God will open the door. I think too often we're wanting to move into the next season without being faithful in the season He's given us, right? We're always like, the grass is greener on the other side, but you got to mow that too. So, oh, let me make it real plain. So you're at the fry line at Whataburger, right? And that's the promised land. It is the promised land, my friends. 
And you're like, when is God going to promote me? But until you're faithful in that season and understand you're doing everything is under the Lord, God can't bring you to the new door because you haven't realized the door you're in. I was driving over with my driver. He reminded me of the story uh, just recently. I'll add it into the sermon. But he says, remember when we would, on Wednesday nights, we just sat around in a circle and like, there was like 12 of us that, that prayed? And I was like, that was if we got a full night that night. Like Sometimes it was three. And, and I remember praying for cats. We prayed for a cat, the same cat, every week. But until I got excited about ministering to the one that would show up every week, God could never increase the door in influence until I was faithful in that season. And here's the problem. Many of you are wanting the new season but not being faithful in the season you're at. I'm going to preach till you say amen. <laughs> no, I'm still going to preach. I, and, so, so there's, you got to see this, if you can sustain a season and be faithful in it and not let it bother you about when the new season is, that'll be the indication that you're ready to move into the new. So as you're seeing this, he's, he, he opens the door based on faithfulness and he says there, I love this language, it's, it's powerful. I open doors that no man can shut and I close doors no man can open. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, I have all authority. He's saying that there's no devil in hell that can stop you from a promotion that I have for you. I don't care if the boss doesn't like you. I don't care if it seems like you don't have the right education. You feel like you don't have the money to start the business. God says, if I open the door, nobody else can shut it. It's like the time that I got to go backstage on a Chris Tomlin concert. Right? Like, like uh, never mind. Let me not tell that story. Um, you're like, you opened it up with it. you got to tell it, Pastor. Okay, so I'm in Scotland with my wife. We haven't dated yet. All right, we haven't gotten married yet. And so I'm trying to act tough, you know. And I'm like, let's see if we can get backstage to this Chris Tomlin concert. So for some reason, it was not guarded by security. So I roll past the doors. And I'm like, whoa, I'm in here. This is crazy. I'm like, Marlo, come on in. And the only way that I made it look like I was legit is I grabbed a cup of coffee. I knew if you have a cup of coffee, nobody's going to think you're not legit. Like anybody with a cup of coffee is in charge. Can I get an amen on that? <laughs> so I get backstage. In fact, we find Chris Tomlin's uh, guitar player. And, and I'm like, who are you? He's like, I'm Chris Tomlin's guitar player. And, and he wants to talk to us. I'm like, I don't want to talk to you. I want to talk to Chris Tomlin. Nobody cares if I get a picture with you. So we finally meet Chris Tomlin. And Chris Tomlin's freaking out. He's like, what kind of security do we have here that they let some random guy come in? And take a picture. Now, I tell you all of that story for no random reason at all, but this, that when God opens the door, it doesn't matter who is there, you're going to get through. Let me give you a more pertinent story. I remember when my grandfather was called to build this church here in Galveston, and God said, you're going to build a building. And when he went to the city to try to get a permit, and they said, we're not giving you, the gypsy preacher, a permit. Now, you can say, well, that's just a city. They're tough. Well, they were so tough on my grandfather that the city manager pulled him into a back meeting, took a cigar, blew smoke in his face, and said, we're going to shut your church down. But I'm here to tell you that even when man's against you, God will be for you. And my grandfather got his permit. You want me tell you how my grandfather got his permit? The meanest man in Galveston got saved. When he got saved, he got radically saved. And he found out that my grandfather couldn't get a permit. He said, I'll fix that. So he went up to the city. He went to the first city council member. He says, I got dirt on you. If you don't give this preacher a permit, I'm going to share it. And then he went all the way down to even the mayor and said, if you don't give this pastor a permit, everybody in the town is going to know what you did wrong. I promise you, my grandfather got a permit that next day. Because, listen, my friends, I don't care if the devil's against you and all of his co cohorts. If God is for you, it doesn't matter who's against you. Isn't that what King David said? When Samuel came to King David and he said, you're the next king, Saul was against him. There was a certain portion of the Israelites against him. The Philistines were against him. In fact, he gets to Ziglag and David's own men are against him. But David writes this, if God is for me, it doesn't matter who's against me. And I'm trying to tell you today that I don't care if you've had a closed door for your whole life, that this is the season that God is opening the door to you and no man will be able to shut it. I feel like a Pentecostal preacher today. So not... Thank you. So, come on, you got two more points. You got to have to pace yourself. I'm trying. 
So, so not only is it, there an open door, but uh, uh, Jesus is the key man, but he looks at the church of Philadelphia and he says, I have an open door for you. Point number two, Jesus has opened the door. Look at your neighbor and say, Jesus has opened the door. Now, this is crucial. I got to nuance a bit. I need you to catch something because many times we come to an open door and we don't realize that we got to push to get past it. I love this in 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter. Paul writes about an opportunity. He writes about an open door in the ninth verse. He says this, For a great and effective door has been opened to me, and there are many adversaries. So what is he trying to let us know? That when God opens a door, Satan's not going to roll out the red carpet and allow it to happen. That you're going to have to face some giants if you're going to get to your promised land. And so this is, this is important you catch because I, how do we nuance this? Because Jesus had also said that I close doors no man can open. Yet sometimes we have doors that we have to go through an adversary. How do I understand what wisdom is needed for me to figure out, is Jesus closing this door or am I facing just opposition? This is important you catch. I believe it's relationship with God that's necessary for you to realize, is it an open door or is God closing the door? Let me give you an example of this. So there's a prophet in the Old Testament named Balaam. Balaam is a, a prophet of God. Many people think he worshipped a false prophet. No, he worshipped Jehovah. But he didn't do it. He, he had some mistakes in his, in his ministry. And one of his mistakes is the king of the Moabites notices that, that the Israelites are conquering everybody. They just defeated the number one superpower, Egypt, and they are coming through like gangbusters. So he realizes, he says, man, if I get Balaam to prophesy, everything happens. Let me get him to curse God's people. So he, he, gets, he sends some dignitaries, some honor, and he sends a big offering to Balaam. And, he's, and he asks Balaam, in essence, can you curse God's people? So Balaam says, let me pray about it. Now let me help you out. There's some things you don't need to pray about. <laughs> if God says it in His Word, you ain't got to pray about it. Let, like, let, me, let me make it make, make more sense. You ain't got to pray about smoking that weed. God said no. Or, or, or uh, uh, Pastor, I want to marry this unbeliever. You don't have to pray about that. God doesn't want you to marry an unbeliever. I may not get any amens today. <laughs> oh, I'm supposed to marry him, right? So he goes to the Lord and asks the Lord. God, they're asking me to go with them to curse your people. God says, what are you doing here? It's, it's crazy. These are my people. I blessed them. You can't curse what I blessed. So he goes to the people the next morning. He says, I can't go with you guys. Sorry, God didn't want me to go. So the king hears about this. What does he do? Does he accept no as an answer? No. He says, let me send more honor. Let me send a bigger offering. So he sends a bigger offering to Balaam. And they say, hey, can you come with us? Balaam a second time says, let me pray about it. Let me help you out. Some things you don't have to pray about twice. <laughs> and maybe you shouldn't. Because when he goes to God and asks, he says, God, should I go with him? God says, go. Now, let me ask a question. Is God schizophrenic? No. Come on, I don't want to preach on that today. But what we don't realize about the character and nature of God is if you butt up against something He told you not to do, He will eventually turn you over to your evil desires. That's Romans, the first chapter. So if you stay stiff-necked against it, you can have all the religious language. You can say, well, I prayed about it. I, I prayed about marrying that person. And God said, I can marry that unbeliever. And then you wonder why Satan's your father-in-law, right? <laughs> So we have to realize through relationship with God, what door has He closed? I, um, th this happened in my life. And several times this has happened, but let me give you the, one of the most pronounced times. Now, I had told you uh, several weeks ago that I was in the stock market and I became very wealthy overnight, but I've lost all that money, so don't ask for it. And so, <laughs> well, when I was wealthy... Me and my wife, we went on to the Bayside looking at some lots, and we were just kind of dreaming, just having a good time. It was a date day for us, and we were like, what would it be like to build a, a house right on the Bayside? And we just began to kind of dream, and we started to pray about it. God, you know, should we do this? Now, I could have taken cash after I tithe, maybe not after taxes, but after I tithe and built the house debt free. That's how much I had. And so we're praying about it. God, should we build the house or not build the house? And it would just, you know, give it to the Lord. 
As we're driving away from the lots, my grandfather called me. Now that's normal. He calls me about once a week. We talk. But he began, just out of the blue, began to talk to me about somebody that had bought too much house and were having trouble keeping it up. And it just, it seemed like they didn't do what they were supposed to do. And he just was carrying on. He had no clue what me and my wife had talked about. And then he said, you know, I love you. And I was like, I love you, Papa. I hung up. And me and my wife looked at each other and knew the Lord was speaking to us. Now, I could have been like, yeah, but I'm blessed and I got the money. I can do whatever. I mean, this is Dave Ramsey. So I could have done all that. I could have bucked against the closed door. But I don't know what would that, what would that disobedience had led me to. You catch what I'm saying? So it's important that you're hearing the voice of the Lord and saying, is it his voice that's closed the door? Or maybe, maybe he stopped provision in a certain season because he needs you to be uncomfortable and transition to move into the other door. Let me give you another example of a closed door. When the children of Israel move into the promised land, God says, I'm no longer going to rain down manna from heaven because now you've entered into the land of milk and honey in Bluebell, right? And, no, that's Texas. Uh, But he closed off the heavens and closed off manna. So they had provision this way, but God closed it off because he wanted them to walk through the new door, the new season, the new provision they had for them. Some of you, you've worked, a, a, I'm just going to make it plain. You've worked a regular job. You've gotten a paycheck every two weeks and God's been speaking to you. It's time to start your own business. And you're like, I ain't doing that. That's crazy. I ain't going to try to do that. And the next thing you know, you show up at your job and they fire you. And you're not one that normally gets fired from a job. Like you're like you're like pastor. I wasn't doing anything wrong this time. Like and uh, this time is the joke part of it. But y'all didn't catch that. Uh, but they they fired you. They let you go. And you're like, what do I do? What's going on? Many times God closes a door in a season, gets you uncomfortable because until you got uncomfortable, you would just stay in this place, not going to the open door He has for you. So it's crucial you catch the wisdom of an open door, but you will in an open door season. He spoke to you. It's His promise, still face an adversary. In fact, let me say it like this. The bigger the adversary, the bigger the door. And so there is... Come on, somebody likes this. There's a requirement on your part to when you see, instead of the opposition, you start seeing the opportunity. Um... I think sometimes the adversary can just be fear. We get afraid of what does it mean to really take that risk or go through that door. And the way you overcome that, it's like the children of Israel when they sent out spies to go into the promised land. Two of them come back and what do they say? They talk about the size of the grapes instead of the size of the giants. So you have to have the ability to see who your God is what the opportunity is, and it's got to seem bigger to you than the risk. Since y'all didn't give me an amen, I'm going to give you another example of this. That's not true. Yeah, it actually is true. I didn't give it to the 9 and the 10, but that's... Some of y'all like coming to the 11 because it's longer. Six of you. Okay, sorry about that. If you like shorter services, the 9 gets out at 1025 every time. Okay. (laughs) Oh! All right, close enough. Okay, so uh, when I was in the military, very secure, it was a very good opportunity. I was, a, I was an officer, I was moving up the ranks, and God spoke to my heart and He said, there's going to come a season where I want you to step out. And when I want you to step out, I want you to resign your commission. I want you to go through all of the extra paperwork necessary so that when it gets tough, you don't go back in. So he spoke that through, to a, through a sermon. I won't give you the, the exacts, but through the sermon, he spoke that to me. So I'm going through this, and I'm facing opposition. The opposition I was facing was sound reasoning. I had family members calling me saying, you know what, the military is a good career. I mean, you can go into ministry in 2021, 2022. Like, once you've retired, you're collecting a steady paycheck. I had the officers, my senior officers were like, well, what are you going to do when you get out? Well, I'm going to go into mission work. How how do you get money? Oh, I got to raise money. They're like, you're going to starve, dude. (laughs) I had sound reasoning speaking to me of fear of what wouldn't happen if I step out. Not only that, I had the wind against me. I was stepping out in the summer of 2008 when the Great Recession was kicking off. Am I willing to go through this? 
Am I willing to resign my commission? In fact, part of me was saying, well, don't, don't go through the extra steps to resign your commission. Just kind of leave that open step out, but in case you need to go back because you weren't called, leave that door open for you. But it was important for me to be obedient. And when you face the adversary of fear, which we all will face, you got to recognize it and say, you know what, the opportunity in my God is bigger than the fear standing before me. Another thing, another adversary, not necessarily fear, but comparison. Yeah, comparison is when you come to your door and you don't like your door, you like your neighbor's door. Why do I have my neighbor? They have a better door than me. And the problem is if you don't understand that God will give you a door, wants you to walk through it and be faithful, but you look at always your neighbor's door, you'll never do what God's called you to do. I, I think of my wife. She came to a, a five, six door. She could have said, that door is too short for me. <laughs> Some of y'all don't know I'm talking about myself. Uh, you're like, no, nah, you're five, seven. God bless you if you think that. And... Uh, no, but, but my wife had a door, an opportunity, and she walked through it. She could have said, you know what, I only want things a certain way. And if you create a mentality, man, it's got to come in this certain package, this certain way, you may miss this initial door God wants you to walk through before you get to the next door. Um, uh, comparison is crucial. I remember when, when Jesus speaks to Peter in John, the 21st chapter, and he says, you're going to die for me. You think Peter would be excited about that after already denying Jesus, he's going to get the opportunity to not deny Jesus, but he doesn't. What does he do? He says, what's going to happen to John over there? Right? And, and Jesus is like, if I, can, if I will John to, to be here when I come back, so be it. You follow me. He's teaching Peter a key that your destiny is tied to following me, not following another, not looking at another. And when you get in the, the place of comparison, it is actually an adversary. And we have it so much in social media. I want you to catch this because you'll see a post. Why would they get to go on that vacation? I didn't get to go on that. I want to do this. I want to do that. People only post their best stuff. And if you keep living a life of comparison, it'll keep you from walking through the initial door you need to. Amen. Not only is there fear, not only is there comparison, I also want to speak to tradition. Because I think tradition can keep you from walking through a new door. Jesus says new wine needs new wineskin. And many times we can't see the new opportunity because we think it's going to come as the old opportunity. Um, so when I go into Montana, I spend time with my in-laws, and we usually go to Catholic Mass. Every, I say usually. We every time go to Catholic Mass on Sunday. And so I love going to Catholic Mass. I'm always, when I walk through the door, I'm like, God, what do you, I, I just open my heart. I didn't grow up uh, that type of church. I grew up drums in the church, Pentecostal, tambourine. That's, I mean, that's how I did it. We rolled on the floor. and I mean, that's, So it's a different style for me. But I'm always, I don't care what kind of style it is. I'm always like, if God's going to be present, the Word's going to be open, I'm going to open my heart to whatever God has for me. And, and it's crazy because my kids are, you know, they've only grown up with drums in the church. So they're kind of struggling. They're like, what is this? Like, and I'm trying to help them understand that God is present when you open your heart to it. So when I get there, I say, God, I'm going I'm to receive from you no matter what's going on. And it's crazy because he preached out of the same passage that I had preached the week before. When I talked about the multiplication of, uh, of fish and loaves, that was the same reading for that week. But I never would have received that had I gone in with attitude. Oh, the Catholics aren't even saved. I can't, they ain't even doing church right. I mean, they ain't got drums up in the church. I'm making it real plain for you because some of y'all are struggling already, right? But I'll tell you this. I've seen, I've seen Catholics that are more saved than charismatic sometimes. Some charismatics, I wonder if your tongue's from God or the devil. I just don't know yet. Stop it, Pastor. I ain't even got into the other denominations who actually... No, stop it, Pastor. Leave it alone. You should have seen me at the nine. I dug such a deep hole, I could not get out of it. <laughs> Somebody knows. I don't, yeah, anyway. Okay, so tradition. I said all of that because tradition a methodology, a style that you grew up with can keep you from something new God wants to do. So it is important that you keep an open heart 
and you're saying, God, what are you doing in this new season? The last thing I want to give you, because some of y'all are yawning at me, is (laughs) notice it's their faithfulness that put them in position. He says, you have little strength, but you've kept my word and have not denied my name. How are you keeping the word of Jesus? You know, when I talked about being faithful, some of y'all were struggling. You're like, oh man, I haven't been faithful. I don't don't know if I'm going to have that open door. Well, I love this because Paul writes, even when we're faithless, God is faithful because he cannot deny himself. I want to give you a revelation that can transform your walk with God. What does that mean? That means simply this, that God has a covenant not between you and him. We, took, we partook of communion today. When we partake, put, partook of that new covenant, that is not between the Father and you. It's between God and Jesus. To what the writer of Hebrews says, two immutable, unchanging forces so that the covenant cannot lie. So God cannot deny Himself. Now this is powerful because whenever you're weak, whenever you feel like you fell short, whenever you thought you weren't faithful enough, it's beautiful because when we're weak, God is strong. I love this in 2 Corinthians, the uh, the 16th chapter, the 9th verse. Paul would write this. You got that there? 2 Corinthians? Oh, look at it. Bam! I love that. Verse 9, he says this, And he said to me, this is God speaking, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities or weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak then I am strong. What's he trying to tell us here? That when you're weak, when you come to the end of the rope, you're actually, you're actually in position for God to show up with an open door. For some of you, that's exciting because you don't know if you can hold on any longer. That, that in your heart lets you know that God is willing to work. That's why Galatians, the sixth chapter says, Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you will reap if you do not lose heart, if you do not faint. And this is the crucial moment. So how do I not faint? Paul lets us know. Instead of relying on yourself, boast in the Lord. When you come up short, stop looking at yourself and start looking to Him. This is how you walk on the water. Isn't it it true when Peter walks on the water... There's a moment he looks over at the waves and when he's looking at conditions, when he's looking at everything going on, he realizes he's just a human. I'm not supposed to break this law of matter and nature, but yet he starts to sink and he raises back up. But it's when he looks on Jesus that he does the impossible. That's the key there. Learning how to not look at yourself, but look on him. When you live a life that's crucified, when you live a life that's no longer about yourself, I'm not talking about false humility. False humility is, I'm weak, I'm stupid, I'm no good. Nobody wants to hear that garbage. Don't even preach that. It's garbage. It's not about that. It's about losing yourself. It's when you don't even recognize yourself anymore, but Him living in you. You say, why do you preach that so strong? Because we have a whole sect of Christians that boast in their weaknesses thinking that's humility. And they never walk on the water. They continue to sink because it's not your life. It's His life in you. And when you live that day to day, then supernatural things come out of you. I gave you the testimony of Salvador up there. And you may look at him and say, man, that dude, he's got it all together. That dude's like preaching and and all this. You should hear his testimony. Of what God brought them through in, in, in the prison life and the being unloved and not growing up on the right side of the tracks and, 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 and stuck in alcohol addiction and, and how it was somebody inviting him into church so he could get 20 bucks that God said, I'm going to get him in that day. Amen. I mean, he came to church to get 20 bucks. He didn't know he was going to encounter the king of the universe. 
God radically touches this man that nobody else would pick in society. And he said, I want to use him for my grace. And you, we could point out weaknesses. You could point out weaknesses in me, like I, I don't have this skill or I can't do that. But I realized when I started to point to Christ, none of that mattered. It doesn't matter if I have it all together or if I do. It's when I point to Jesus that I can walk on water. And listen to me. When you start to focus on Christ in you, the hope of glory, that's when there is no door that will be shut to you. Y'all wearing down on me. They used to preach for two hours about two decades ago. Come on, give me some grace now. All right, let me give you an example of this. Of somebody that manifested Jesus saw an open door. They arrest a guy named Peter. He's arrested. He's actually about to die. King Herod's like, I killed James. I'm going to kill this dude. It's easy. They have him so locked down, he's got prisoners on each side. Now, how do you respond to something like this? If you respond like Jesus, you'll have an open door. This dude's fast asleep. He's so asleep, an angel of the Lord shows up. That's brightness. That's crazy. Angel of the Lord shows up, has to kick Peter to get him up. He's so deep in sleep. It says Peter even thought he was in a, a dream. He was like so gone. And yet when he kicks him and wakes him up, he breaks off every chain past every guard. The iron bars couldn't even keep him down because when God opens a door, no man can shut it. But how did that opening manifest? He became like Jesus. The, doesn't Jesus say that? I had somebody quote me on, on YouTube and said, no, nobody can be better than Jesus. I'm not saying you're better than him. I'm just quoting his words, this is, which is this. The works that I do, you shall do, and even greater. That's what he said. And then we see Peter do it in the New Testament. So what if you're not living up to your potential? The only reason I'm keeping preaching is because y'all got silent on me. I was supposed to end two stories ago. I want you to catch this though. If you don't get anything in my sermon, get this. You're called to look like Him. And the more you look like Him, the more you'll walk through open doors. Isn't that what happened to, to Saul and Silas? They get beat, thrown into prison. And Saul looks over at Silas and says, let's start singing. Who sings when they're... Silas is like, this dude lost it. I'm sure. So he's like, sing, Silas. What do I sing? What a mighty God we serve. <laughs> doors open for them that day. What doors have not opened for you because you continually look to yourself instead of manifesting Jesus in the situation? That's a good word. I'm going to listen to that later when I'm on the treadmill and amen that thing. <laughs> I'll end on this story. So I remember when God uh, opened the door for me. So um, um, I was trying to graduate, really struggling. I've mentioned a lot of my video game addiction that kept me uh, struggling in school. And, and I finally was really close to graduating. I'd actually completed all the course requirements, all the classes needed. But my GPA wasn't high enough. I didn't know you needed an extra requirement. So they sent me a letter that says, your GPA is 1.96. You need a 2.0 to graduate. And I'm like, oh, man. And so I just, my mother-in-law was working at UH Clear Lake. So I said, let me just take her class. I'm sure she'll give me a decent enough grade and I'll graduate and move on. And, and so that had been my plan. And I, I remember talking to the Army. I was in National Guard. I was about to go active duty. They said, but if you don't graduate this semester... What we're going to do is we're just going to keep you in the National Guard. And I was okay with that. I don't, you know, I don't mind the National Guard. It was good. And, and, and so I was like, okay, well, that's my plan until I had a dream. And in this dream, I remember I was traveling towards this glorious, this beautiful city. It was almost golden, just amazing. And as I'm traveling towards it, I get stopped. And there's this body of water in between me and the city. And when I wake up, the Lord speaks to me. He says, if you don't graduate this semester... You'll see your destiny, but you won't reach it. So the fear of the Lord hit me. I mean, God's speaking to me about closed and open doors. And so I go to my first teacher, and I'm, I'm, I had three classes, and I said, I, talked, I wanted to talk to him about raising my grade. I, I, I said, you know, I'm in the Army. I won't go active duty. And he simply told me, he said, it'll violate my conscience. I don't give out grades. You earn what you earn. And I said, oh, man. 
I went to my second teacher and the door was literally closed. I couldn't like, it was a closed door. Then I finally went to my third teacher and my third teacher had the map of Afghanistan against the wall. Now this is right after 9-11. And so when I began to explain my story about active duty, he had compassion and he raised my grade to what was needed to walk through that door. Amen. I, I was excited about it. Some people get summa cum laude and magna cum laude. I got thank you laude that day. And, uh, <laughs> that joke never gets old. But I tell you that story because when God opens a door, He'll want you to walk through it. There'll be challenges, but there will be no man that will shut it. And you in this season are in an open door. Can we all bow our heads together today? Hallelujah. I never want to close this service without giving you an opportunity to know Jesus. Jesus says, I am the door. He says, I am the way to the Father. You know, I talked about walking in God and reaching your destiny, but the first step is accepting His Son, Jesus. When you accept Jesus, He completely transforms your life. He takes you from somebody that maybe was living for self to now living for Him. Has sin got you down? Are you tired of addictions? Are you tired of, of living for yourself? I want you to know there's a Savior that loves you right where you're at, but He doesn't want you to stay there. He wants you to actually change. You say, are you sure about that, Pastor? I've heard that, that God's against me or that, that i got to get it all together. My friends, it says in the Scriptures that when you were an enemy to God, that God demonstrates His love to you by sending His Son, Jesus. He loves you right where you're at, but he, wants, he desires for you. He's inviting you into this relationship. I also hear people say, well, okay, well, when I get it together, when I get this thing out of my life or that thing out of my life, then I'll say yes to God. And I always say, you know what? You're a good Galvestonian. You know you have to catch a fish before you clean it. And if you say yes to God, He actually does the work of cleaning you off. That's you today. You want to say yes to God for a first time or maybe you want to rededicate your life. You know, I'm the grandson of a pastor. I gave my heart to the Lord at a young age. But through a series of disappointments, I walked away from God. And I remember in 2001, through many invites of my father and prayers of a, my mama, I went back to church and I rededicated my life to Jesus. Never to be the same again. I wasn't perfect, but I then had the perfect one living on the inside of me. That's you today. You want to say yes to God for a first time. Or maybe you want to rededicate your life to Jesus today. I want you to raise your hand high in the air. I just want to pray with you today. A day of new beginnings. A day of a fresh start. A day where you don't have to be bound. You don't have to be in the addictions anymore. You don't have to say yes to weed and marijuana. He can actually transform who you are. Father, you see all those hands lifted up towards you. Jesus, we believe you died on the cross and rose again. And we simply come to you today. Change us on the inside. Make us brand new. We want to follow you, Jesus. We're tired of living our own way. We want to go your way. Jesus, we believe you rose again and you're seated at the right hand of the Father. And God, you're more than a God. You're now our Father. Teach us Guide us. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would fill us. Fill us to a place where we're no longer the same again. We live a life of overflow. In Jesus' name I pray and the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Say this with me. Say, Jesus is, Lord. Jesus is Lord. I believe with that simple prayer and confession, you are brand new in the kingdom of God. Old things have passed away. All things are new. I want to give you two words today. Welcome home. Welcome home. You're in the family of God. Amen.